the second in our series of uh, Child Safety Online series uh, for the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. I'm Tim Lorden. I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. We put this panel together before uh, the end of session because, in the end of this Congress, because there's a lot of issues related to child safety on the Internet and, and legislative solutions and regulatory solutions being batted around. We wanted to have a three-part look at this particular issue. Last week we did uh, a, a panel looking at the requirement that all websites would have a sexually explicit label um, and, and metadata associated with that particular label. Um, today we are looking at um, the question about whether sh con should Congress decrease social networking and chat sites teen-free zones. Um, the idea is to look at the regulatory and, and, and legislative issues circulating around um, these, this new phenomenon, which is call, sometimes called Web 2.0, but uh, teens online um, in, in communication platforms. To, uh, next week, or actually on October 5th, which is two weeks from now, um, we'll do the third part in the final part of this series called Warehousing Consumers Online Travels to Catch Predators and Terrorists, Privacy Implications. And that looks at the issue of data retention, which was discussed quite a bit, actually, um, in he two hearings yesterday in the Senate Commerce and Banking Committees, respectively. So we'll look at that issue on October 5. You have an invitation to that, which is right here. Um, so feel free. The other thing I want to mention is part of the series, we produced uh, one-pagers. We asked all of our uh, members of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, which is over 200 organizations, to submit one-pagers on their efforts to combat uh, uh, child predators and keep kids safe online, and we've compiled them into a, a booklet for you. It's interesting reading. A lot of just, they're quick. It's a quick read. One page is from uh, a lot of people in the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, including MySpace, Microsoft, um, Enough Is Enough, uh, Progress and Freedom Foundation, and the Internet Content Rating Association, among others. So, welcome. Uh, today's today's event um, again is called "Should Congress Decree Social Networking and Chat Sites Teen Free Zones." Um, we, there's a lot of discussion about whether uh, teens should be restricted from these sites. There's a House uh, bill uh, called DOPA, the Deleting Online Predators Act, which would uh, prevent them from uh, accessing those sites at uh, schools and libraries that receive federal funding under the, um, under the Act, um, uh, the, the E-Rate Act. Um, but that is not the, the, limit, the sole scope of this particular panel. What we want to talk about today is uh, what's going on with this whole phenomenon, which is social networking. Um, are these sites uh, so awful with regard to predation and, and, and pornography that we should need try to restrict teens from them or impose some other measures that would um, uh, make them more safe? And then secondly, are there any re redeeming qualities? And lastly, if there were a way to uh, restrict teens from these sites, what would it be um, beyond, beyond DOPA and restricting uh, blocking access from schools and libraries? So that is pretty much the scope for today. We uh, have compiled a, a, a great panel of experts from uh, around the country and actually here from uh, the East Coast as well. Um, let me just introduce them immediately, then I'll start off with some moderated questions. I'm going to leave time for a question and answer um, at the end. Uh, first off is, is Dana Boyd. She's a PhD candidate from the School of Information at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, largely considered one of the foremost experts on the social networking phenomenon. She's researched it quite a bit. Um, her dissertation, she actually also is a social media researcher at Yahoo, but you're not here in that capacity, I assume. Um, in addition, uh, you, for five years, have worked at V-Day, an organization working to end violent, violence against women and girls worldwide. Um, our next panelist is Donna Rice Hughes, who has been a good friend of the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and we've known Donna for years and years and years, uh, for one of the earlier uh, online child safety advocates out there. Um, founder of ProtectKids.com and, and president of Enough is Enough. Um, she's internationally known, that's, that's, that's fair to say, definitely. Um, in September 2005, uh, Enough is Enough just launched a, another uh, awareness campaign called the National Internet Safety Awareness and Parental Empowerment Program, and that's funded by the Department of Justice. Um, also, we're very happy to have uh, Jay Chaudhry, if I pronounce that correctly, uh, from the office of Roy Cooper, who is the North, uh, Attorney General for North Carolina. Uh, Attorney General Cooper is probably one of the most um, active and outspoken um, uh, Attorney General out there on, on this particular issue. Um, Roy, uh, <clears throat> Jay has actually had a stint on Capitol Hill working for Russ Feingold, if I'm correct, and um, uh, so happy to have you back on the Hill. Adam Thayer is a senior fellow at Progress and Freedom Foundation. He's the director of PFF's Center for Digital Media Freedom. He's worked at the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation. And um, we've actually had him on uh, half a dozen panels uh, over the past like six years for the Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and we're happy to have him back. So 
Um, that was a kind of a long, long introduction of the panelists, but it's really important to see where they're all coming from and some great qualifications to be on the panel. But um, if, if I can start off by just a general question uh, of the panelists. Uh, Jay, um, Attorney General Cooper um, has advised parents that they should uh, block their, their kids' access to social networking sites and MySpace. Um, or at least make sure they don't post personal information. What he's called it, uh, these sites a smorgasbord for child predators um, who want to stalk their next victim. Um, what, what is it about these sites that um, causes so much concern for Attorney General Cooper? Well, thank you, Adam, first for inviting me and allowing me to share the perspective not only of uh, Attorney General Roy Cooper, but uh, also other attorneys generals that are part of a working group that are exploring uh, ways to reform and make social networking sites uh, safer. I think the question that you've asked uh, as far as blocking kids from social networking sites um, really involve two concerns. Um, the first concern is that uh, children that get on social networking sites have easy access to inappropriate uh, content and material, a material that is often sexually explicit, uh, pornographic, and objectionable. Um, I would invite uh, anybody in this audience to log on to a social networking site and recognize how easy it is to um, lie about your age and then gain access to this material. And as a result, um, a group of attorneys generals are advocating that these social networking sites employ some kind of image and filtering software. Uh, the second concern uh, with regard to the social networking sites is really probably the more important one, and that is the unwanted contact by child predators um, with teenagers. I think uh, the, the news is pretty replete with stories of, of child predators that have contacted uh, children underage. Uh, last week in North Carolina, a uh, police officer was arrested for raping a 14-year-old child that was lured on MySpace. And we've also heard um, from our conversations from investigators that uh, social networking sites are really a haven for child predators um, in finding their victims. Um, the attorneys general, uh, a number of them have advocated that uh, two steps really. One, that the social networking sites employ a minimum age requirement, that being 16, and second, that they use some kind of age verification technology. And let me just add one point here, Adam, before I uh, conclude. Um, the age verification technology aspect is critical, and I think there's a great deal of debate about that, and we can have that discussion this afternoon. But if a social networking site elects to uh, uh, incorporate image filtering or devote more staff in, in screening the number of filtering images, all of that can really be sidestepped by a user falsifying their age, which means that a predator can get on um, a website by lying about his age or her age, and a child can get on by lying about uh, his or her age as well. Okay, thanks. Um, Dana, is, is, you know, you've, you've researched social networking, you've, you've um, looked, talked to teens that have been on social networking sites, you're on social networking sites yourself. Is, is what we're seeing in the press and, and, and some of the um, uh, stories out there, is that an accurate picture of what's going on or is there something else going on in social networking sites that, that you can help us understand? Sure. Um, to give you a picture, unfortunately the media's coverage is very extreme compared to what you actually see. That doesn't mean that there aren't ac actually problems and there are, but we're talking about 100 million users. Um, unfortunately, if you look at the statistics, you're much worse off um, in your home, um, uncles, stepfathers, they're actually a far bigger problem than predators, which is really sick to see and one of the things that breaks my heart every time. Um, the numbers are actually going down on the internet of the number of predators that are reaching out. Um, and this is one of the things you want, you're seeing from the UNH reports where they've been studying this for years. They talk about this number, that you've, you've heard the numbers of one in five and one in seven. The numbers are actually going down. That doesn't mean that there are not sexual contacts. Most of the sexual contacts, though, are from fellow teens. So if you actually look at that one in seven number, over 50% of it is fellow teens. Um, out of the remaining 50%, uh, most of it is actually 18 to 23, 24, often contacting 18-year-olds. And so there's a little bit of a tension of you know, what age is appropriate um, for people contacting each other. The, the situation for predators, the sadness of predators, is that a lot of it can be um, looked at or you can see it within the homes. There are often problems ahead of time. So there's two different kinds of behaviors you see between adults and minors. One are kids that are actually not in good shape themselves, and they're actually seeking levels of attention um, from uh, mostly older men, anybody who will give them any amount of attention, and they don't care, um, which is really frustrating to see. 
Um, the other is the people who, the teens who actually use it as a level of risk. And these are, these are the ones that actually most parents are m really concerned about because the first group of teens are unfortunately not in the best homes and they, they don't have the parents that are supporting them. There's another group that have, um, their situation is a level of control in the home. And this is why you're seeing a, a rise in anorexia, bulimia, self-mutilation, cutting. Um, and one of the other extreme behaviors that you see in the home for kids who have extreme control uh, situations is that they will actually seek out um, often 19, 20, 21 year old males by pretending to be 18, 19 themselves um, when they're like 14, 15. It's not that different than actually things we've seen in physical space for a long time, namely the kids who would go to frat parties when they were 14 to try to pick up uh, local college boys. Um, and this is a kind of behavior that's that's really difficult in how to uh, sort of handle that one. Um, but in terms, of, in, in terms of looking at how to solve the predator problem, um, there are a couple of situations that need to be dealt with. One, this stuff is reported all the time. I've worked in a ton of tech companies that report this to FBI. There aren't enough people that actually deal with it. One of the things I'm desperate for from federal governments is people that will actually respond to these calls and deal fast, actually go after these guys, because we often know them. Okay, great. I don't mean to cut you off, but we can, we can get to some of the reporting issues in, in just a second. But for, um, for Donna, um, Donna, you, you're doing a lot of education. You've done education uh, for the past uh, 10 years on, on these issues. What are you telling parents um, with regard to what's going on in this, in this, in this space, and, and what would you tell this audience? Well, first of all, I'd like to say um, that I agree with um, with both Day and Jan, uh, Jay and Dana. I just <laughs> <laughs> I do, I'm doing that now. I don't know if it's a menopause thing, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, what we find as the weak link in the chain are the parents, and um, and I think that's so unfortunate. And I truly am convinced that once our youth become parents themselves, we won't have these challenges because they have been brought up on the internet and they're very well equipped to protect their own kids and they understand the dangers. In fact, um, as we speak across the country, um, oftentimes I ask parents um, how, you know, how aware they are of the dangers that their kids can come across on the internet and specifically we deal with it enough is enough protecting kids from all types of pornography, whether it's child pornography, obscenity, and harmful to minors, and also protecting them from sexual predators. So those are our two uh, main focal points. And most parents, you know, raise their hand. They think they've got a pretty good handle on the problem. And then once we go through a demonstration and we show them how the pornography industry works, how they're actually targeting kids, and how intrusive this um, material is, and, and also the nature of it, they're shocked. When we take them through chat rooms and show them how predators can very easily track a child, even when the child just leaves um, bread trails around the internet with little pieces of information, not really a lot of personal information in one place, how that predator can just in a matter of minutes, if they're um, you know, very technically savvy, the predator find that child and actually get to their home or at least know how to, to reach them. And parents are shocked. So what happens here when you have social networking sites, you've got a combination of what have been all the problem areas of the internet combined in one. And then you, you add to that that these, I mean, you know, the, 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 the word on the street with these kids now, if you're not a MySpace or you're nobody, you know, um, and you have all that peer pressure and the desire to be part of this, you really do have a, a huge problem. You know, we think that the social networking sites are predator magnets because where youth play, predators prey. That's just the way it is. And predators know how to get to these kids, and kids are vulnerable. Um, and we want them to be kids. You know, that, that's the thing. You know, we, we try to educate kids to um, understand the risk and to be careful about putting personal information up and that sort of thing. But at the same time, we don't want them to grow up too fast. But yet, in social networking sites, we're trying to teach them you know, how to think the way a predator might think. And, and, and so we've got a lot of issues here. But in particular, parents are just simply ill-equipped. So our position has been that age 17 and under kids are safest if they're not on social networking sites. However, if parents decide to let their kids go on these sites, they need to do a tremendous amount of research. They need to go on those sites themselves. They need to decide whether the risk 
or the benefits outweigh the risk and then be very, very proactive because they cannot um, necessarily trust the social networking sites themselves to be doing um, everything, uh, you know, to protect all of these kids. Now, we know a lot of them are, like uh, MySpace, are, are taking, you know, great strides here as far as the, um, the measures that they're taking to protect kids from uh, inappropriate content as well as sexual predators. But still, parents are the first line of defense. And again, back to the weak link in the chain, um, they're very ill-equipped. To, um, to really protect their kids. So what we say, it, we, we've, we've got a lot of information for them. Our Rules and Tools program really does equip these parents um, to, to make sure that their kids are safe. Um, but at the same time, we just find that so many parents just either want to you know, keep their heads in the sand or throw their hands up and pull the plug. Well, uh, Adam, with regard to the wink leak of the chain, uh, if they aren't uh, parents, what, is, what are the policymakers to do? And what do you think about the, the theories about suggestions of, for our solutions? You know, Tim, every generation of parents has their own sort of boogeyman and creates a sort of culture of fear around that technological boogeyman or media source, uh, from the waltz to rock and roll to comic books to rap music. There's always something. And a new generation comes along and experiments with this new technology or media outlet, and parents get a little crazy or concerned, as they should be concerned about what their kids are experiencing. But with each generation, these fears pass because we assimilate that technology or type of media into our lives and get used to it. Uh, I'm fond of saying now that the best thing that ever happened to the video game industry was having social networking come along because it moved them off the screen as the latest boogeyman du jour. Um, but, you know, it is a serious issue. There are concerns about what happens online. But in terms of these being social networking places where kids meet up with other kids or potentially other adults, you know, I visited social networking sites when I was growing up, but they were called shopping malls. I rode my bike through the cornfields of rural Indiana to get to a local shopping mall. My parents didn't even know where I was at. I suppose they probably would have been a little more comfortable knowing I was behind a keyboard upstairs rather than being at a shopping mall they didn't know I was at. By contrast, we live in a world now where parents do need to take more control and hopefully will, and when they do, they'll find there are many, many ways to exercise a great deal of oversight over kids. Um, when my kids grow up, they're not going to like it, but their first little Disney phone is going to have a GPS tracking device in it so that I can trace them wherever they're at. And I'll probably have a keystroke logger on their keyboards to figure out every website they go to. Now, I'm a little bit more technologically savvy than the average parent, but let's not get, you know, let's not get away from this point. Fundamentally, we have to start with the question of parental responsibility. And I also think we have to start with the assumption that kids are going to get onto social networking sites however we define them because it's not just about MySpace or Facebook or LiveJournal or anything else. How about online gaming? You go online to Microsoft Live and you can, through a VoIP connection, talk to all sorts of people you don't know, including people who could be twice your age. I mean, there are all sorts of technologies. Every type of Internet site, the Internet itself is one big social networking service when you think about it. So we have to be realistic about the fact that kids want to interact with other kids, and sometimes even adults, and figure out how we're going to deal with that. I do not believe the culture of fear and this sort of demonizing these sites is the way to start that dialogue. Well, let me, let me uh, Dana wanted to make one, one reply comment before I get to my next question. I think Jay is grabbing <clears throat> the microphone as well. I wanted to respond to Donna for a moment, that the comment about, you know, where kids p play predators prey, which is, I agree with. But one of the things that's very ironic about MySpace, this is the first time ever in these technologies that we've had all the teens in one place. And that's actually a really shocking thing because it's allowed a lot of people and a lot of police officers to come and do their jobs really effectively and really efficiently. And one of the most frustrating things that I've watched since we've started attacking MySpace is that actually kids have fragmented, predators have followed them, and we don't know where they're going. Uh, what do you mean fragmented? They've go they're going to a ton of different sites, a ton of different places online, a ton of different services, things you've never heard of, things I've never heard of. Um, it's hard to follow because it's going through different clusters and different groups everywhere. It's not just like they're, they're moving from one site to another site. They're moving to a, a, all sorts of things. And the people that are watching them are watching this. And so one of the things actually about aggregating them in one place is that you can work with police officers to be like, okay, let's go after this and let's hang out. And which is one of the things the police officers did really well. They pretended to be 14-year-olds. And if you're actually trying to be 14 and trying to attract predators, you can do it pretty effectively. So police officers have actually attracted more predators than teens. Interesting. Uh, Jay? 
Uh, let me make a, a couple of comments because I don't want I don't want us to confuse the issue, and I think it's important to strike a balance. I, I don't think uh, most people would disagree that social networking sites have its benefits, as Dana has um, talked about, that it's an opportunity for a youth to explore their identity, to negotiate their identity online. But if it is a haven for teenagers, and there are no gates that are that are designed to keep adults away from children, then it does become a, a haven for predators. I think as Donna. Rice has talked about. So um, I, I think what we're talking about here is to strike some kind of balance for for adults and children and how they use social networking sites. Um, Dana also talked about the small percentage of, of, uh, of cases that have taken place um, on MySpace or, or on social networking sites. And let me say that I, I think that even though there may be a low probability that's taking place, that we know these numbers are increasing as children complete continue to use this medium. And we also know that um, that the one in seven statistic that Donna talked about, even though that is a, a less number than what came out five years ago, the, 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 statistic, the statistic that came out from the crimes against children, that one in seven are solicited for sexual solicitation, still demonstrated that there was aggressive solicitation remained the same among, among children. And to Adam's point about this being the new mall, I, I, in a mall, when you're stepping place in a mall as a child, as a parent, you have physical cues to recognize whether someone you are talking to is an adult or not. That simply doesn't exist on the website. When your child meets somebody on the other end of a computer, you don't know whether that person who you're talking to is a 45-year-old predator or not. And I, and I will say, finally, that um, the notion that we need to educate parents is absolutely correct, and I think the work that Donna is doing at Enough Enough is, is, is wonderful, and I think Adam has reiterated that as well. But parents cannot do this job alone, and industry, social networking sites, have a responsibility to provide effective tools to make sure that our parents are safe. Can I just add to that, Yeah, too? of course. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, ever since we uh, took on this issue of Internet safety, we have looked at, you know, how do we really deal with these issues um, effectively. And we've been promoting all these years um, a shared responsibility or a three-pronged approach between the public, which would be the parents, the educators, anyone that is actually with that child at the computer, and then industry, the technology industry, and the legal community. And each one has a very unique and distinct role as far as protecting kids. And unfortunately, because of a lot of reasons, whether it's lack of aggressment of um, existing laws and, and the difficulty of tracking predators and that sort of thing, a lot of the responsibility has, again, fallen onto the shoulders of parents, again, the weakest link in the chain. A uh, second um, thing I just wanted to say uh, with respect to what Dana said, um, you know, there are social networking sites that are doing a lot um, that we've actually been working with. For instance, MySpace. Um, and I think they are probably in the situation, Tim, that AOL was in back in the early days when we were dealing with the Communications Decency Act and the Child Online Protection Act. You know, they were, uh, AOL were, were the ones that got demonized. And I think MySpace is just because they're big, they're huge, and, you know, and all the kids are, are on there. But yet they're the ones, I think, that are, are beginning to set a standard and show us what the industry can do. Now, have they completely arrived? No, but are they working on it? Yes, they are. So, um, you know, they do have a measure of responsibility. And unfortunately, Dana, like you said, you know, if, um, if kids start going elsewhere, some of the other smaller and less popular sites, or at least, you know, not so well known to us, um, are not going to be taking, you know, the measures. And, and of course, you know, we end up back in the situation, well, does Congress have a, a role here? Should there be some rulemaking or oversight? Well, I guess, I guess that's a really good question because we've touched upon it. I think everybody's touched upon that particular question is um, whatever rules we take, whether they be household rules, whether they be um, state rules or federal rules, um, are we going to essentially drive teens away from whatever um, regulated sphere, whether it's um, uh, a social networking site in a particular state or in, uh, in the United States, are we driving them elsewhere, fragmenting, as, as Dana said? Um, what are the avenues of exit, exodus? How many social networking sites are there? How many are um, outside of the U United States? And, and how many would abide by the good, good corporate citizenship that Donna has just articulated with regard to uh, what MySpace is doing and, and, and other sites are doing? Is that a problem if, we, if, if whatever measures we take, whether it's federal legislation, whether it's um, having consent decrees with a, a social networking site to have an under, no under 17 year olds allowed, if we drive kids elsewhere, is that possible? Are there other places for them to go, and is that a problem? 
Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. There absolutely are other places for them to go. First of all, social networking is a worldwide phenomenon, and the Internet itself is. There are two reasons why this is important. What we're talking about here is the unintended, potential unintended consequences of regulation. And if it in any way discourages the companies themselves or the kids that use them from going somewhere else, namely to the dark alleys of the Internet, uh, that may be offshore somewhere. We want to keep these companies here in the states, and despite the fact that there are problems, we know they probably have better practices in terms of dealing with those problems than some others might. But I was woke up this morning before our panel here and found the front page of the Wall Street Journal talking about Facebook and just Yahoo. Be, just before the panel, you woke up? <laughs> <laughs> I, doesn't, doesn't it seem like it? I'm still a little fuzzy. But I actually did read a paper, so that's a good start. And it says, uh, it, this, this points out how easy it is for the, not just the, the architecture of the Internet to move or the, the servers or whatever else, but the kids themselves, they're, they're quite mobile in the online world. It says the danger of building a business around networking sites is the fickle nature of their, cons their consumers. As the Internet has sped up the life cycle of success and failure, it is possible some of these sites will flame out as their young devotees flock to the next big thing. And that's exactly right. I mean, if you place some sort of overly burdensome uh, requirement on kids, like say that they have to perfectly verify who they are or what age they are, it could be that they say, hey, I'm out of here. I'm going somewhere else. And that somewhere else might be somewhere in Thailand that we don't want them to be. So that is a risk, I think, from many different perspectives. Uh, Dana? So one of the cool things in Asia, where actually people start getting on the social network sites at the age of eight, um, is that uh, their parents and other adults in their community go and hang out there too. And this is actually has a parallel to a lot of our historical situations for where adults hang out and be a part of a community. One of the things that's sort of frustrating when watching a lot of the sites pull up in the States is that parents avoid it like the plague, just like they avoid any other place that youth hang out. They're not actually part of the milieu. They're not going and actually spending and socializing and whatnot. Because when parents are hanging out, and you see this from, from a lot of the teens that I talk to, when the parents are hanging out and like, just be like, you know, that's really just not cool, the kids actually back away without actually these extreme attacks. Um, and so there's this moment where we have where we can actually even get adults involved in actually being a part of that life that does so much more than, um, than trying to regulate it away. Because it is true, they will go to these other places, and there's no way that QQ or SciWorld is even going to think of following the rules that we have in the States. Because they know what benefits it has for a lot of the young folks, but they also know what benefits it has to have parents hanging out there as well. So what you're saying is if there was an age verification uh, requirement or there are other requirements domestically or statewide or even site-wide, um, what we'd see is a, a, a dramatic amount of exodus uh, to other sites. Yeah, I mean, we'd see, we'd see exodus to international why, why, why sites. Wouldn't, why, wouldn't kids just, why, why wouldn't just kids uh, abide by the rules and, and parents enforce them? When have kids <laughs> ever played by the rules? <laughs> um, the question is, like, can we... Can we get social workers hanging out there? Can we get people, we do teen outreach and physical publics all the time. Let's think about how to get some of these communities that actually know how to help teens to be a part of that situation. And we can't do that internationally nearly as well as we can do it in states. Um, I, I would just say that um, with some of the more popular sites like Facebook and, and MySpace, I don't think we'll see a, a mass exodus because they've already got their their blog set up and, and their profiles and their, and their friends list and everything else it's like you know people say why are you still using AOL and it's like well because I've got my address book I've got everybody and everybody knows how to reach me I mean there are some things that I think that are already in place to keep these kids there and also you know not all kids are going to you know buck uh, parental responsibility and everything else, you know. So um, I think some will. I mean, there will be a segment of, of these teens and youth that will go other places. A lot of them will not. Um, but I do uh, want to say, too, Dana, that um, one of the things that we encourage parents to do is to get on these sites. Before you ever let your child go on the site, spend time on the site. Get your own profile. Get your own account. And, and do some surfing and find out what's out there. And we have found, even in instances where, there was one instance where there was a priest when I was speaking to a large congregation at, at a Catholic church, and he was the youth pastor. And he was actually online watching what the kids were doing. And I gotta tell you what, those kids started you know, minding their P's and Q's and they were very careful from that point on once they realized that there was someone who cared about them 
that was looking after them and, and, and trying to help them. And even if they weren't really out of line, sometimes kids just don't think. And that's really the issue. I mean, there's a lot of um, studies now as far as brain imaging and the development of the, of the, of the ch child's brain and the ability to be able to discern and, and to reason and that sort of thing. And sometimes kids just don't think. And anybody out there that's a parent realizes that. And you go, where did you leave your brain when you did this? I mean, they're not necessarily um, making the wisest choices, and we do have to have, you know, uh, the adult community work together to, to protect them so that they can enjoy these sites and these, you know, the benefits of the Internet or social networking um, w without, you know, the, the, the downside of the dangers. Well, that raises an interesting question, and, and Dana had kind of brushed on it before, that you're saying there's, there's, there's some social value to these social networking sites where you have pastors online communicating with his flock, essentially. I think there can be. There can I don't be. think there's nearly as, an, enough, and I absolutely agree with what she said. That sense of community is mostly, you know, with the kids themselves. And, um, and you know, we're talking with these sites about actually getting parental controls put in place so that the parent can exercise some measure of control and management okay. like they do you know with a filter or, or labels or something like that um, but right now you know that's very difficult the kid is managing their space rather than the parent and mm -hmm. that's when you've got an under 17 year old that's you know that's a problem sometimes. Well, well, J well Jay that begs the question if if there are so, there can be as Donna says some socially beneficial things and there is according to Dana some really socially beneficial aspects to social networking does it make sense to limit teens 17 and under uh, from these spaces? Are we missing, are we throwing the video of the bathwater? Are we missing opportunities for some socially important and relevant um, developments in whether it comes to education, uh, faith, uh, et cetera? How do, you, how do you address that? Well, again, I, I think the way to address it is to balance those interests between um, the benefits that a child can get on social networking sites um, against kind of keeping children protected. And I think that's a real challenge for industry. They've got to balance the edginess and the coolness factor um, with kind of keep children safe at the same time. And I think the argument um, I think that Adam was making that these children would flee into another social networking sites. I have to say that I agree with Donna. Um, for one, uh, children invest an inordinate amount of time in developing their their um, social networking profiles. I mean, they use HTML code and um, they've befriended hundreds of people to uh, develop their website. And so I think there probably would be a less likelihood of them actually abandoning a website. Uh, secondly, you know, the idea that, uh, that these children would flee and, and that we wouldn't have an effective kind of response by using, say, age verification, for instance, is that you can't, we can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, I think, as Attorney General uh, Cooper talks about. I mean, we, we have laws that are designed, we have driver's licenses that are designed to keep children out of bars, and yet we know that children may go drink underage at their home. But yet, I think we can all agree that uh, having driver's licenses and IDing young adults before they get into a bar is, is a good measure. In fact, it's an adequate measure, but it may not be completely effective. And I think what we're talking about with social networking sites is something similar. And to the last point about the fact that the children may flee to Thailand, let me just make one comment. I think it was interesting that uh, Rupert Murdoch's wife was in China, I believe, this week in exploring a MySpace China. And I think if anybody knows the experience of Yahoo, I think the Chinese government will have a whole lot more to say about what can be regulated and filtered in China than they will in America. Actually, QQ is much more open than My MySpace, which has 150 million users. Well, I, I think the Chinese government has also kind of decided as to what objectionable material can't be used with regard to political speech, certainly, is with respect to tai Taiwan. Well, Adam, let me re let you respond to that. Well, I hope we're not going to become China on Internet policy. That's my first response. <laughs> uh, that would be uh, something that would be a disaster, in my opinion. But I, I think that, listen, I mean, I, I don't know when we're going to get there with age verification, and certainly I'm not willing to rule out these sorts of solutions to find ways to verify kids online. However, we are not there yet, and there are some serious questions about how we're going to get there. Namely, how much information are we going to require to be collected, collated, cataloged, whatever, and by whom, to verify kids who are, are who they say they are? That's a tough question. And by the way, there are lots of laws that say you can't collect that information. Going back to 1974, privacy, there are many others I could cite. The fact is, is that there are good reasons why society protects information about kids. And basically, if you really want to get at the best information about kids, we know where to go. It's schools. 
we're going to have to basically find a way to rope schools into this if you're going to use some sort of a database solution of cross-verifying kids or who they say they are, unless you, are, unless you find some other type of technological solution. So, uh, I mean, there are reasons to be worried about that, but let me say something cutting in the opposite direction, which is do we really want to require every kid to necessarily force themselves to be verified before they can get online? I mean, I hate to say this, and uh, of course Stephen Balkan here is tired, tired of hearing me say this story, but it's sort of confessions of a Dungeons and Dragons nerd. Uh, I give this story all the time at Stephen's events. You know, I grew up with too great of a familiarity with 20-sided dice and rangers and wizards. And I was a little nerd, you know, and I had a sheltered time in my life when I really wanted friends and couldn't find them in the real rural community I lived in. I would have loved to have social networking sites to explore and find friends. But you know what? I probably would have not necessarily wanted to necessarily at that point in my life give my name and talk about what a big nerd I was. So maybe there would be a reason for me to not be verified before I go on and talk to other people and socialize and experience other people's cultures and find friends. Um, so I'm not necessarily there yet, even if we had the solution, in terms of whether or not it's a good idea to mandate it, especially in light of what I said earlier about the unintended consequences of what kids might do if you force it. So why, why, can't, we, why can't we verify <clears throat> and essentially block um, anyone under 17 or, or 17 and under from social networking sites, have, them, have these sites themselves apply the rule domestically, and have these sites block teens uh, 17, or 17 and under or under 17 from these sites and implement um, some type of age verification, whether it's a third party authentication or whether it's a um, credit card uh, number or, or whatever. Why can't we do that? Kids no. don't have credit cards or driver's license or they don't have homes, mortgages or car loans. I mean, right, you have so to have some piece of information, right? That's how we verify adults. Donna? Yeah, um, well, we've been dealing with age verification um, for a very long time uh, from the Communications Decency Act and, and COPA, where in those cases we're using. Uh, we're proposing to use credit card verification to determine whether someone is an adult and then can therefore get onto a pornographic site. And we ran across a lot of First Amendment issues there, and as you know, anybody that's followed COPA has been held up in court since 1998, not just for that reason alone. However, um, one of the things I think is worth exploring um, is age verification for a number of reasons, and, and it may not necessarily be credit card verification, but I think even more importantly, parental consent. Um, we talked about this when we had a summit on social networking, and, and, and I think if, if we had some sort of way, and I don't, we don't, you know, haven't figured out exactly how this might work, but we are exploring this with, you know, Hamu at MySpace and others, um, you know, to where you could have a win-win, where you could actually get parents involved, you know, with a parental consent, type of a, a situation, and, and then also they could then verify their own child's um, age. We, there are two primary, primary problems with, with the age issue on these sites. One is this, uh, verifying that someone is um, at least 14 to 17 years old because the age limit on many of these sites is 14. The other problem is the under 14 crowd, and it's very difficult um, unless a site is using algorithms to make sure that, you know, that the kid is really who they say they are, and some of them are. MySpace is doing that. Um, and they're kicking off, I think, 30,000 a week or something, Rick, is that right? But they're finding out that they really aren't the age that they say they are. But I think that you know, we've got those two segments of kids, the, the 14 to the 17-year-old and the under 14 that are lying about their age, because right now all they have got to do is change the, their birth date, and they're on. And, um, and so that's difficult. So I would really like to find some solution to get the parents involved with parental consent. Um, they could use credit card verification and everything else. And I know, you know, kids' privacies and ki kids' privacy issues and kids' rights and everything else. As far as I'm concerned, I've raised, you know, two teenagers and, you know, under 17, you know, I, I want to have involvement, you know, but, and anything we so can do to encourage that would be a good thing. Okay, so we're talking about a couple of proposals here on the table. One is um, anyone under 17 should not be allowed on social networking sites and we can implement some type of age verification system where, which would, you'd only, if you were 17, you could um, submit a credit card or, or verify that you're 17 somehow. Or driver's license. Yes, and that which would keep all the, anyone <clears throat> without a driver's license or that type of verification right. out of these sites. Um, and I guess the second one you're talking about is is having parents be the authenticators of the child's age. Mm -hmm. um, so the parents could say, well, my son or my daughter is 14, is 15, and then you could create an age-appropriate milieu f um, as they go on these sites. Um, Dana, how, do you, how, how reasonable do you think either of those proposals are 
um, in light of, we talked about avenues of exodus um, and opportunities for other social networking sites. And you had mentioned earlier in your opening statement about that teens are probably more at risk with regard to, uh, in statistically speaking, their, their family members and, and, and people that live within their homes than they are with str strangers. How, how do you how do you address those two possibilities? Sure. First, I want to say something about the mass exodus. When I say mass exodus, I don't mean they're all going to run away, but they create multiple accounts all over the place. A lot of teens I talk to have more than one account on MySpace alone. Um, and so there's different reasons why they do that. And their primary use of MySpace, the ones who are leaving, they're still using it for their primary asynchronous messaging, i.e. what you do for email, they do on MySpace. Um, in terms of a lot of the age verification, I understand a lot of the proposals. I don't know that they're realistic. I have yet to see one that I really believe is functional and will work in a way that's not so invasive. I mean, I should note, I was that teen who grew up. I was first generation of kids who grew up online. And being from rural Pennsylvania, being queer, having the opportunity to go online and find you know, other kids, there was no way I was going to talk to my mom. Sure, my mom and I are doing a lot better now. But there was no way we were going to have a conversation about what sites I was visiting. You know, and there was a lot of good reason not to. And you know, I look back, and a lot of the kids who were in my position killed themselves. And that's one thing that I'm so excited has stopped because of a lot of the online. Like, the number of queer kids who've grown up who are not killing themselves is amazing. So there's some reasons why I don't want to see all kids be able to be identified on all sites. Now, that said, I want to see ways in which we can, we can create a conversation where the kids and the parents are, ha are talking and where the kids learn to actually recognize the material that's going on and what they see. And that actually is far more important to me than a lot of these age, age verifications, which are much more about restrictions for certain kids to try to you know, outmaneuver, um, for certain adults to try to outmaneuver, at, to try to be children, because a lot of this doesn't actually work. I mean, I've, I've faked my way into numerous sites by being both my kid and my parent. Right? Like, it's, even a lot of those parent verifications, they're not going to work if, you, if you're savvy enough. And these teens, they know it. They know it, it protects the 8-year-olds, but it doesn't protect the 15-year-olds. Um, so I want to see ways that will allow, you know, the conversation to emerge. That, you know, we all meet strangers. You guys are strangers to me. I don't know who any of you are, really. But we have this conversation, and I learn to actually recognize what I can trust of you. And what we need to teach kids is a way to actually recognize people and learn to negotiate it. And we also have to realize that most kids aren't meeting people online, even people they think that they're their own age. And that's great, because one of the problems with the physical space is that you actually meet them, and they can attack you right there. Well, interesting you'd mentioned um, <clears throat> uh, if, you, if you had social networks, it could prevent people from killing themselves. And you're talking about suicide and, and, and distress. Um, at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children Social uh, Networking Dialogue that was hosted in June, um, there was representatives from the uh, National Suicide Li uh, Hot Lifeline uh, there, a fellow named, uh, uh, I forget what his name was, John Draper. And he said that referrals from MySpace um, have become the largest source of calls to the, from teen, by teens to the suicide um, hotline. And um, that's just an interesting. Uh, I thought that was really fascinating. Right. Most of most of the major sites, if you contact them, they have suicide hotline numbers that they give out. So actually, Live Journal's been notorious about this. Where you, unfortunately, Live Journal has attracted some of the most um, troubled kids, um, marginalized kids, and so they're really great. If you see something on there and like this kid looks like they're in danger. You contact um, LiveJournal, not only will they give you numbers to try to get at that, if it looks really, re really eminent, they will track down IPs and get try to make as many calls as fast as possible. That's fantastic. So the, the converse is that you're, you're suggesting that lives are being saved by social networking <clears throat> sites as opposed to... Oh, yeah. Because uh, it's much more visible. You can see what's going on and you can respond. Unfortunately, we don't, we don't actually see what's going on with a lot of kids in everyday space, but the parents are not equipped or willing to respond. Well, let me, um, let me go to the audience for some Q&A. Anybody have a, just welcome any questions from special staff, try to limit any type of uh, long statement, uh, <clears throat> and I'll cut you off. Uh, I apologize in advance. Sir? That's the main reason people are leaving MySpace is actually their parents. It's not predators. Okay, but so, so then how can you suggest that we need to get parents more involved so they make that same 
So one of, the, one of the things that I've seen that's worked really well, there are actually parent, parent communities that have decided that they will not look at their own kids' site, but they will look actually at and check on each other's. So there's a moment about community and not just looking out the moment you see your own kids' material. One of the things you've seen Facebook go is have limited profiles, things that are only visible to parents. There are a lot of hacks that are starting to emerge to try to actually change your profile depending on who's looking at it. So there's ways in which teens can actually be present there but don't necessarily have to interact directly with their parents there, but can actually interact with other adults that care about them. Pastors are actually a really important character because they understand kids are not always in their best shape, but we'll still have a conversation with them and they're somebody that they trust. You see a lot of youth, um, youth minister work um, folks there, you see a lot of, um, you're starting to see social workers, and that's the big population that I want to encourage to get on there. People that work with teens, and they care about teens, but aren't going to flip out at them. The danger is when you flip out at them, and that's what I want to stop. That's what, I don't want any parent who's going to flip out at their kid to be on the site. But anybody that's going to be on there and start a conversation and be trusting, and you see some of the, like, the cool parents, right? the, you know, the parent in the community that all the kids go to to talk about whatever crisis is going on, those, those parents have been on MySpace and have been amazing resources for groups of teens. And so it's like, it's not all parents that I want to see there. That, I agree with you. It's not going to work for a lot of teens. Well, I'll tell you, one of the things that we encourage parents to, to do all the time is not to pull the plug, <laughs> whether their kid comes across pornography or has a sexual solicitation or whatever else, um, but to, to you know, work alongside with their kid um, as far as their use of the Internet and that kind of thing. And I, and I, just, I just had a thought as, we were, as you were talking, Dana, um, about possibly the benefit of monitoring um, these, uh, the under 17, the 14 to 17 year old crowd and, and maybe in a, in a way that um, AOL has monitored some of their chat rooms with some trusted adults who can kind of look and say, hey, you know, that's probably a little too much information, you know, that could attract someone, blah, 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 you know, and that kind of thing um, as, as, a, as a possible, you know, something that some of these sites might consider. And again, you know, Rick could certainly speak more to Rick Lane back there who works with MySpace. On, on some of the things that MySpace is doing, but I was very excited to, to learn some of the things that they are actually doing, where um, you know the, there there are you know the profiles you know the, uh, the under 17 you know they have to give permission for someone to actually see their profile, and then I think it's the under 16 or or the 14 and 15 year olds that um, they uh, they've even got a, a more restrictive um, type of, of privacy there for that age bracket. But again, I'm very concerned about the under 14. You know that I think that's a big problem, and I don't know what the numbers are there, but you know, that you you know how you remember when you were 12 years old, you wanted to be 16. You know, when you're young, you always want to be older, and when you're my age, you want to be younger. So, you you know, it's um, but uh, you know, I think that that's a huge problem, and and one where age verification or parental consent could be very beneficial. Well, let me let me before I go to another question, I think this gentleman over there had a question. Age verification in the in the manner that you're talking about, getting consent. Uh, and establishing this user is a 14-year-old, and, mm -hmm. and there'd have to be a tremendous amount of paper trail to, to verify that. Uh, and, and, and we've seen a lot of data breaches. We've seen how insecure some of our national databases are with regard to laptops being, you know, lost, um, hacks. Um, you, you know, even Hewlett Packard apparently can get access to a tremendous amount of information if it needs to. How do we secure those databases when the most sensitive um, citizens in our community, children, uh, their information is being warehoused. Isn't that a, and well, the, the what COPA do you commission, mean by, huh? What do you mean by secure? I mean, if the kids are putting incredibly personal information on their profiles, what exactly are you concerned to, about protecting as far as a database of information? For a social networking site to verify that this person is, this user is 14 years old, they have to get the consents, they have to file that paperwork, they have to house that data somehow. So they're storing the data about the teen or the 14-year-old. The How can you just have an age verification where the parent says, yes, this is Johnny and he's, you know, 15, and, you know, the parent gives his information, you know, just, you know, the way parents you know, set up um, AOL account, set up parental controls, the parent actually set up the account rather than the child. I mean, why wouldn't that work? Because kids won't Tim, play. Tim, can, okay. I, can I answer that question just for a minute? Um, to be very simplistic, as Attorney General uh, Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut, who co-chairs this committee, has said, if we can put a man on the moon, we can certainly do age verification for children. Um, but not to be too simplistic, our discussion with vendors um, have shown that age verification can be done for almost 99% of the population using different data, even if that data is, is, not, is less available for those under 18. Um, 
um, for instance. And it can be done consistent with privacy laws, I think, which was a concern that Adam had. I mean, a third party uh, vendor can act to verify the child's age without having to collect that information, which I think was a, was a question um, that you asked. With, um, with parental consent and things like with that. With parental consent. And, and the other issue, which you know, Donna touched about, I mean, I think the, the idea of privacy for these children, to me, is very interesting. Because let's not forget, these are commercial websites. Uh, Facebook just was just bought out for a billion dollars, or at least there are rumors of that in the Wall Street Journal today. It provides a wealth of amount of information of how a very hard to reach demographics, how they engage and what their marketing uh, interests are and so forth. So we can talk about privacy, but we can also talk about privacy that's available to marketing and advertisers, which is one of the biggest reasons we see some of these um, big merger, the big deals that are taking place. Adam? You know, I, we could sit here and debate the specifics and the nuts and bolts of age verification all day, but realistically, I still don't understand how this is going to solve the problem at hand in terms of the predator problem. If that's what the real problem in this debate is, why are we not dedicating as much time and as resources uh, to that issue in some way as we are to this issue of treating kids like the bad guys and getting them to perfectly verify and be, you know, end their anonymity before they can go online? Let me just read you one statistic from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, the Department of Justice, that in a survey of 1990, uh, they went through the 1990s and surveyed sex offenses. Of the sex offenders they surveyed, the average sentence imposed on sex offenders was eight years, and they were out after three, serving just three and a half years. You know, why are these creeps walking the streets? I don't know, but they're behind keyboards, and if we want to talk about the real problem, that's not a MySpace problem or a, a, a social networking problem. That's a government failure in the extreme to find a way to put these people behind bars. Now, luckily, we just passed a new Child Safety Act that increases mandatory minimums, and that's, I think, the best way to deal with that problem. But we need to ask ourselves, isn't there a better way to dedicate time and resources to that problem? Because I, I continue to insist on the fact that you know, kids are going to get online. They're going to find a way to get online. And if you want the best possible parental consent or control, it's not necessarily getting some sort of consent saying they are the age they, they say they are. It's taking computers out of bedrooms, putting them somewhere in a visible area in a home, and turning the screen around so mom and dad can have an eye on them. Go ahead and mandate that, but you don't need to mandate it. Just have every parent follow that simple rule. It's far more effective than any other thing to get kids knowing, hey, someone's trying to keep an eye on me. I need to behave myself. Tim, Tim, can I just respond to that? And then Donna. Uh, um, I, I totally agree with, with Adam with the idea that we need to have uh, stronger laws on the book against child predators. In North Carolina, we have increased active jail time. We've also increased the resources that have gone to the Computer Crimes Unit of the State Bureau of Investigation that is under the Department of Justice. But I think Adam is kind of suggesting that this is an either-or proposition, and it's not. I mean, it, in order to be effective, it has to be comprehensive. So it requires that we educate the parents the way that enough and en is, en is enough is doing. It requires that we have more investigators to catch child predators, but it also involves responsibility by industry to make sure that our children are safe and that their websites are not used to lure minors. Yeah, I, I just want to go back to this three-prong approach again. Um, we, you know, we've talked about parents being the weak link in the chain, and I would say that the second uh, weakest link would be um, law enforcement and, um, and even, you know, possibly Congress, you know, when we can have some rulemaking for, you know, increased sentences. Why, you know, predators and why pedophiles are back out on the streets after one and two, you know, egregious offenses is beyond me. Um, but uh, one of the things that um, actually Hamu suggested, and if I can share a couple of things, I, I actually agree with him. You know, we have a sex and offender. Hamu is? Hamu is the, what is he, the technical chief? Chief security Hamu. officer. Okay, and I can't States. actually give his full ni name justice, so we all call him Hamu, for all of us who know and love him. But anyway, um, a sex offender email registry was, a, was an idea. And I thought, well, you know, that's, that's an interesting, you know, idea. That they actually, um, and if, if, if they don't, they have a, an email, if, if you're going to let them back out, that they've got an email. Um, account that, and if they use any other email um, online, that they it would be a violation of parole. It was just a thought. I'm throwing out some thoughts here because you know, as, as we're looking at the, t the the main dangers here, whether it's kids' access to illegal content, whether it's obscenity and child pornography or or harmful to minors when it's um, on the internet, and also sexual predators, um, that criminal activity, still the burden is falling on very much the industry and on um, on parents and kids themselves, and it shouldn't be there. You know, I would love to see the internet where, you know, why is there obscene material out there? Why can't we get this, you know, child porn down? Um, you know, why are sex offenders, you know, uh, and pedophiles, you know, 
trolling the internet and grooming kids on a very regular basis. This really just shouldn't be. I mean, if we could really aggressively enforce the laws and, and look at, you know, what new laws we need to, to put into effect, I, you know, I think it, it, it would be just tremendous. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, oh, here was another thought that Hamu had. <clears throat> Criminalizing the age misrepresentation of adults. Uh, when an adult pretends to be 20 and they're really 35. You know, I mean, there's just some... some Didn't you just say that you were trying to be younger? <laughs> <laughs> no, we're talking about pedophiles. <laughs> we're talking about, you know, predators will often gain the trust of a child by pretending to be that child's age. And again, I'm just throwing out some stuff from Hamu. We used to, you know, work at the well, Justice Department. I, I just think we've got to get a little creative here sure. on, you know, how are we getting the bad guys? The kids aren't the bad guys. The parents aren't the bad guys. They may not be, you know, terribly um, uh, internet literate, but, you know, we want to get the bad guys here and, um, and then, you know, have industry and, and parents and everybody do their part. Well, no, not to interrupt, but uh, Dana. I just want to, I, I realize why there's a lot of um, efforts to put the onus on industry, but industry is not the only place where it should be happening. One of the things you have to think about with these sites is that they're a form of public. They're a way in which people are engaging in a public sphere. And so this is one of the things that we think about our police officers, we think about our social workers. Things also do have to happen on the community level, not just on the industry level. To expect industry to just go and hire tons of people to look at the site is unrealistic. To engage industry with local representatives that, that are worried about the safety of youth in all forms, online and offline, because part of the trick is actually watching the transition between the two. It's not just online or offline. If you engage the local communities to have that conversation, that's actually much more effective than thinking just about what, tech, what industries can, can hire and deal with. Because there are, they are in a one location far, far away from where the kids actually are. Well, I'm, I'm being remiss about taking audience questions. Sir, I think you had a question earlier. Well, I, I, let me go to the latter one first. <clears throat> According to six months ago, the Department of Justice had claimed that they had a list of over 200 social networking sites out there. Um, and if you go to Wikipedia, which is a source of all authentic, uh, <laughs> all credible information, as you all know, um, you know, there's a good 88 sites listed there. <clears throat> I would say a good 40% uh, of those are are overseas. One thing that I've been, I, I, I was concerned with, there is a site there. Um, uh, it's like. Um, uh, hives. It's in it's in the Netherlands, and and what concerns me is a, a website, a social networking site that has over a million users in the Netherlands. The Netherlands just came out and they had a a <coughs> pedophile political party, and, and a court in the Netherlands found out that it was they were perfectly within their rights to be a pedophile political party. So I am very concerned about the exodus issue. Um, but I think um, earlier Dana was saying that there's probably over thousands now. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how you define them, right? A lot of people are defining social network sites to include blogging sites and to include gaming sites. If that's the case, it's definitely far into the thousands, with a huge majority of it being outside of the states. Almost all of the gaming, popular gaming sites are outside the states. Um, the social network sites that are popping up, there's at least one per country, if not a lot more. Um, so you, I mean, and. Most of them are in foreign languages, so they're not necessarily what you will hop on. Like you can't really get into Mixi unless you, unless you speak Japanese. So it's not not really going to happen right away. Um, and it, so it just depends on which, what things they support and what they don't. But the vast majority of them are actually not in the states. Um, it's just that most of the things that are in the states aren't in English, so that at least is a barrier. And the other question, just briefly on the first part of the question, I think it's a good idea to make it a violation of parole for a sex offender to get on to a social networking site, or maybe on a computer period, I don't know if it's feasible, but you could at least try to enforce that. But m the more important question is what to do with them before they even get on a sex offender site and on a registry, because there's nothing more infuriating to me than looking at the map, uh, sexregistry.com or whatever it is, and you can use Google Maps to show like where the sex offenders are in your neighborhood, and I just see all these dots around my home where my kids play in parks, and I say, why are these creeps walking the streets, you know? So I want to deal first with the question of why those dots are on that map, keeping them locked up longer, potentially, um, and then we'll deal with the issue of what, what when, the, when they get out, you know, what kind of restrictions we can place on them. 
Tim, can I just add one thing? Uh, to answer to another angle to your question is on age verification technology, we've been told by age verification experts that you can verify in, in a, a user and use that information to scrub it against the National Sex Offender Registry. So the, the notion of using age verification technology can also be used to uh, filter out um, registered sex offenders. That question, sir? So Enron destroyed that for you. <laughs> Honestly, like most companies out there have a 90-day thing for their internals. I'm sure actually probably whatever email system you do has the same because we don't want to keep those records and we're trying to scrub them everywhere. So I can't imagine actually a way to balance some of those issues. Um, I mean, the AOL leak didn't really help anything either. So I mean, there's a... So there's one is, you know, like a company not wanting to keep data just because of its liability. And the second is... Do you realize how many terabytes of data this is? <laughs> There's a feasibility you know, issue, which is one of the reasons that none of this stuff is actually cached. Like, MySpace isn't cached. They can't, the, the amount of data required, the amount of servers required to do that is unreasonable. And even, even Google is just like, ooh, far too large for us. <laughs> well, I, I, forgive me for cutting this off. We do, our, our event on October 5 is on this very specific issue, so we'll spend an entire panel talking about the uh, the implications of, of data warehousing and data retention for those purposes, whether it's uh, child predators and child porn or whether it's, it's, it's terrorism. Um, but the second part of your question was, I think, um, having these sites, social networking sites, um, almost take a step to restrict how much information their users um, post up on the sites. Now, how, what about that proposal? If they do that, people will flee. Uh, I mean, you, you're not going to want to have a lot of restrictions on what you can post unless it's maybe of an extreme nature, pornographic, whatever else. Now, that's something that many social networking sites already do. MySpace, for example, polices all the pictures that come in to make sure that they're not obscene and, in fact, has restrictions on people posting stuff or using other types of photo uh, hosting services to post pornographic images on the site. Dana, correct me if I'm wrong on any of that. But, uh, I mean, so there are some steps that are taken like that. But, of course, there's a balance. I mean, if you went too far and said, well, you're getting into what we constitute now as hate speech, you know, uh, how far is that going to go? That might work in Germany. It's probably not going to work in the States. So or, yeah, or let me... Well, they are was, doing some of that at MySpace. I mean, they are right. looking at, at certain types of um, content and blogs that have a, what they call a mature theme um, and then limiting the age bracket of kids that can actually access, you know, those areas. Um, I'm trying to think of what some of those are right now, but... Um, All the porn divas. Hmm. I mean, it is important to remember that, you know, the porn industry is using MySpace to celebrate things in the same way that, like, frankly, Paris Hilton is actually classified into that space. You know, the people who were actually making money off by selling a level of sex that's just kind of terrifying um, as part of mainstream media industries. So they're definitely, you know, they're using these sites, and there's a lot of actually great work to try to restrict that and keep that to its own world. Um, the interesting thing to watch with some of the porn divas, um, and I call them that because the, it, this is actually pretty mainstream porn, not, not the you know, well, question of what mainstream and whatnot is. Um, but meaning, actually, what they have is, prof like, suicide girls. So what they have is profiles is actually pretty, you know, l like, not particularly interesting. But, you know, like, they're really cute girls with, like, fake tits. Um, and so 14-year-old boys try to run around and actually collect them. And so there's actually been a conversation within the porn community of, like, whether or not to even accept these friends because, like, they understand why these young boys want to collect them to show them off. But they're like, mm, this isn't what we're trying to actually go after. So there's, in many ways, actually, the porn community, the, the, the legitimate porn community on MySpace has actually been really good at having this conversation. 
there is a question of a lot of the stuff that's not particularly legitimate that wants to, to reach out. In terms of you know, what they're actually looking at, they are looking at photos. They are looking at videos. Um, they are looking at links. I mean, one of the things that made MySpace what it is is that um, they accidentally left open a security hole. And so people hacked it to be able to put up anything that they wanted. Now, they haven't turned that away and said, OK, we, we'll ban you know, all hacking. What they've, al what they've allowed or they try to be really careful about what is linked to. And that's actually where the, the data becomes more dangerous. And this is where you hear about viruses and you hear about some of the actual porn information coming back, coming in that they don't see because it's, you've got this whole level of encryption coming in, so the way it's actually reformatted. So there's these tricks that MySpace is actually trying to look at in terms of what is that content coming in from external, and how do they deal with that. But Tim, I think Tim, let me just go to Jay. If I, I mean, I think Dana has shared an example that I think um, creates complete outrage by parents. I mean, the, the use of porn divas to attract uh, teenage boys, I think, is something that has been deemed, I think, unacceptable by parents. No, it's the reason boys that are trying to go after the divas. The divas are trying to push away the boys. Okay. Well, the idea that the framework is established for that in itself, I think, is, is the reason that we continue to feel complaints from parents uh, about their concerns about this website. To answer the question that was posed to the audience, uh, just, just two things. One, the terms of service agreement on, on some of these um, social networking sites do prohibit the sharing of personal information, and that's that's a good thing. I mean, I think the less personal identifying information you share on your website, the less likely it is that somebody will be able to, to track you down. And secondly, and I know we don't want to cover this today, but I just wanted to share for the record, um, Nick Alexander and Hedda Litwinner here from the National Association of Attorneys General, a 49 attorney generals um, signed a letter that uh, supported the legislation that you're talking about on the data retention, and that was something that Attorney General Gonzalez had shared um, at the Senate, Senate Banking Committee hearing. All right, well, did we take a left turn on that question, or did we get it answered? Okay. <laughs> uh, in the back there? I'll just take a few more questions. And then. Let me, let me. Let me repeat the question for the camera because uh, it's not the microphone. Uh, the interesting thing about getting schools involved and actually having a curriculum to teach um, literacy for issues like social networking and access to uh, inappropriate material like spyware and things like that. Yes, and I think this is an excellent point. I just want to clarify. I was talking about the dangers of getting schools involved to the extent that they would be responsible for age verifying along with social networking sites or something like that. But the idea of getting schools involved in terms of education and media literacy is very important. I think it's one thing that just about everybody can agree on. It's a mystery to me why we don't have more of a media literacy type of a program or curriculum in, in this country from very early levels to teach youngsters how to be savvy media consumers and to be smart about the decisions they make online. There might be other innovative ways to find uh, uh, educational outreach at the school level, like the D.A.R.E. program. Um, you know, anytime there's a lecture on, you know, don't do drugs, how about a lecture on don't talk to goofy strangers online? I mean, th there can be ways to integrate in lessons at many different levels from the very earliest years. I mean, my daughter is only five years old, but she already knows how to load up a disc and a tray and start her Dora game. I mean, the future is now. So I'm having to deal, my wife and I have to deal with this right now about figuring out how to create a media savvy, media smart child. So it's both in the home and at the school level. And that's something I would hope more industry would get behind and spend serious money on in terms of literacy and education efforts. Um, there are many, many programs that are currently available that are wonderful. Um, uh, uh, iSafe, uh, WebWise Kids has several programs. Are, uh, these groups, uh, even the National Center, are in the schools with uh, good, good cyber um, curriculum and, and cyber safety curriculum. Um, and I think the problem there, as is with us, you know, is is lack of funding. I mean, there's some great resources. It's just wide distribution it, it is a big, big issue. So I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel. That's one of the things we keep saying. You know, we're not reinventing the wheel. You know, let's use what's out there and let's see where the real loopholes are because there's a lot of um, duplication and triplication and everything else. So um, actually, you can come to our site and we do refer, you know, out. I
I beg you to put it into the standards. One, I mean, I've been visiting schools, right, and that's where I, I've, been, I've been visiting so many schools. Like, there are great programs out there that the wealthiest schools use, which is one thing, but any school with techno-literate -liter folks just bans the sites. That's their response. Um, they don't, there's, there's no time, unfortunately, in the curriculum to do media literacy, and it's depressing to walk into today's schools because of the standards, because they're just running for them. So if you want to get if you want to get media literacy into the schools, it really needs to go through the standards. Is Virginia Virginia. going that way? Uh, I guess maybe one more question. But I would, can I just add something sure. to that? I think there's something that the Association for Attorney Generals could, could look at as far as on the statewide level, you know, what could be done, you know, statewide to encourage um, this, this kind of um, implementation of the existing cyber safety curricula that are out there. There are many to choose from. They're all very good, mm -hmm. um, you know, and take a look at that. I would even go so far as to suggest that maybe we, you know, we had the equivalent of a national seatbelt and airbag campaign, safety campaign in this country for many years and finally got up the, the usage of these things. Now, of course, it's not a perfect analogy because there were also laws passed. <laughs> so, but I, I think a lot could be done before we even get to the question of laws uh, that would just have more public awareness being created by PSAs at the government level, at the industry level, so on and so forth. But maybe that seatbelt campaign is one model we could use. But it's not just knowing that you want to try to be safe. It's teaching, it's teaching on a hand what's going on online, learning how to use the sites, learning how to read information, all sorts of interpretation information. Like one of the reasons why the, the don't talk to strangers thing works is that your parents are sitting here talking about what concept of stranger we're talking about. It's, it's an on-hand interaction activity, not just a PSA, which is why I desperately want to see it in the standards. And unfortunately what that means is it's got to actually evolve with the new technologies. So one of the tricks with that, with that kind of a standard system is to be able to know how to move. I mean, all of the ones that you were talking about, they're great. They follow every new technology to learn to do whatever's going on. So it's not just about marketing. It's about actually like, learning it in, in schools on hand. And um, just as far as the public awareness campaign, I mean, that's what we actually went to, to Congress with, you know, as, as a member of the COPA Commission. You know, we, as, as well as the other commission, you know, said government needs to put some serious dollars behind a national public awareness campaign. And that's what we are actually doing right now. Um, and not just with PSAs. I mean, I think PSAs are great. We have a rules and tools program. And what we're trying to do and just drive home, especially to parents, is you need both safety rules and software tools. One without the other isn't going to work. But if you understand the basic dangers and you understand the basic, you know, Internet Safety 101, you can protect your kids from 95% of what's out there if you do both of these um, both of these things. But one of the other things we're looking at, and what I found to be the most effective with parents, is when you actually get to sit down with them in an hour or an hour and a half training seminar, and you show them you know, what the dangers are and then what they can do, and you actually equip and empower them with real practical solutions and turnkey solutions um, as well as, as far as software tools go to protect their kids. And, um, and hence, you know, that's, that's what our campaign is all about. And again, you know, back to the issue you know, of funding. You know, every, I mean, we, if, if we could really tackle this like we tackle some of the other huge issues of our day, like terrorism, you, you know, and put some real money behind, you know, a Smokey the, you know, Smokey the Bear campaign or a seatbelt campaign and that kind of thing, you know, because we've got to, because this generation of kids that are growing up with uh, computer illiterate parents and also why we're trying to figure out all the, the laws and the rulemaking and the enforcement and everything else, well, and we, we've got this generation of kids that are at risk that I don't think the next generation of kids are going to be at risk, at least with these technologies that they've grown up with themselves. Okay, well, uh, just as a, a, a concluding comment and uh, with looking forward in the future, I guess I'd have to say, as, as, just ask you to answer the question uh, to conclude, is if we did implement a, a rule for uh, domestic sites that had to keep kid, teens off that 16, 16 and under, um, looking forward, will we have solved the problem of predators? And what effect will that have had on um, the kind of the social beneficial aspects that Dana has talked about? If I could ask you just to conclude on that one question. Will it, will it work? Jay? I, okay. Well, um, let me 
let me conclude by thanking Tim. I, I was, we were talking about identities and since I think Adam and, and Dana talked about being from rural Pennsylvania and in, in Indiana, you know, Donna and I are from the Carolinas, but I did call Tim um, Adam in the beginning and I apologize for that since we've talked about negotiating identities and everything. Um, so to, to, uh, to answer your question, um, no, I, I think as, as I've said before and as the Attorney General of North Carolina has said, um, we can't let the perfect stand in the way of the good, but we certainly um, are of the opinion that uh, some kind of age verification technology taking some additional uh, restrictions will reduce certainly the number of incidences that we're taking that are taking place in the country as far as meetings between children and child predators and I think also reduce the access that children have to inappropriate uh, content material but as technology continues to change Tim I think that the challenge there will be more challenges I mean just because a bank devises a new safe lock doesn't mean that robbers can't get smarter in figuring out a way to, to break into the bank. Okay. Donna, I'm sorry to cut you yeah, off. Yeah, I, I just absolutely agree. I, I don't think it's not going to solve the problem. I think it would reduce some of the issues that, that we're dealing with. And, and again, it's the, it's the 14 to 17 year old crowd and then the under 14 that really, you know, the, these sites are saying, you know, they've got those age limits, but there's no way to, to keep the 14 year olds off that aren't going to tell the truth about their age. So I, I think that that barrier of entry, um, which age verification, and even more importantly, parental consent, I'd love to see something that would tie those two together. Because again, we're looking at trying to get parents more involved in um, protecting their kids online. Adam, would a national standard? Uh, I, I would just say that the solution here is education and empowerment or uh, the, the safety rules and software tools line. I like that. I think that's the core of what's going to solve this problem. And then I, I want to see the enforcement angle uh, beefed up in terms of going after the real bad guys in this debate, the predators who might be out there lurking and preying on our children. Dana? The reality check is that uh, if you want to find porn, you can. And unfortunately, as my email tells me, even when I don't want to find it, it comes at me a little too much, which I would love to stop. Um, if a teen wants to find it, they're going to be able to find it from the Playboy all the way up to the Internet in any form possible. The goal for me is to make sure that they know what's going on, that they can protect themselves. And I want to see education come into play as the primary thing. Um, I'm frustrated that we spend a lot of our time and effort for the legislations, which I don't believe will be effective. I don't think DOPA will stop a single predator. And that makes me really sad because, don't get me wrong, I'd love to see those guys off far, far, far away from children. Um, but I want to see it done in a way that actually is helpful for the youth. And youth need public spaces. And the more that we take those away from our teens, the more trouble we're going to be in. Well, in, in, in conclusion, I want to thank this great panel. Um, and, <laughs> and again, remind you that October 5th is our next event in the series on data retention, warehousing, um, consumer information. Thank you very much. Um, can I just let you all know that we do have a copy of our rules and tools and our position on social networking? Um, if anybody wants to grab some, we'll have them right up here. That's fine.